infinite complacence, people went to and fro of the earth about their little affairs, serene in the assurance of their dominion over this small, binning fragment of solar driftwood, which by chance or design, man has inherited out of the dark mystery of time and space. Welcome to another episode of Into the Fray. If you're new here, I hope you're enjoying it enough to head to your podcatcher of choice to rate and review the show. This helps it aggregate across the listening platforms, which will turn into more people willing to come on and share their encounters. If you've been listening for years, I'd ask that you please do the same. Home base for Into the Fray is IntoTheFrayRadio.com. There you will find all episodes, blog posts, and get bonus content info. Speaking of that bonus content, on top of the free weekly show, I also produce bonus content for Patreon and Apple Podcast Premium. On either platform, you get all bonus audio episodes and early releases, each one ad-free, of course. Full disclosure, though, Patreon has a bit more in the way of perks because of their interface. Over there, you will get video versions of patron-only chats, e-private Discord channel, and merch at certain pledge levels. So head to patreon.com slash into the fray or your Apple Podcatcher app to sign up for bonus content today. You can find me on the big three social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. The Linktree link in each of my bios will take you to all the places you want to venture regarding ITF, including small town monsters documentaries, various ways to listen to the show, beyond the fray books, contact info for me, and more. And lastly, and really honestly, most importantly, if you'd like to share your encounter or encounters on Into the Fray, the best way to get in touch is by emailing me at shannon at intothefrayradio.com. And without further ado, Let's get to the interview. We are Nuna and Al Bear. So we're in our 50s. We're a married couple. We live in Washington State now. Myself, I, my background is I've been through a master's program in psychology and research methods, statistics, the scientific method, which sometimes can definitely come in handy. And I'm also half First Nations Cree. So I was raised both in uh, the Cree traditions. My, that half of the family was originally from Saskatchewan, Canada. The other half of my family is white. And I was r- raised in Southern California because my very traditional grandparents moved from, you know, Canada to Seattle and then down into the LA area. So that's, that's the basics on myself. So, and then there's Al. Yeah. I'm a medical professional and first responder. I'm also on the autism spectrum. And those two things are relevant because being autistic gives me a bit of a flat emotional effect. And then also does due to my job. I've had 30 plus years of practice and training, not freaking out or panicking, no matter how sideways things get. So sometimes people think it's a little bit odd that I can really calmly talk about very disturbing and traumatic things that have actually happened. And that's why. So I figured I should just get that out of the way right up front. So I grew up across the street from Nuna. So that's where we, yeah, yeah, that's where we, that's the, that's the gist of it. And also, you know, I've been 
in the first responder field from the psychiatric side of it too. So yeah, so we've been around a lot of people who have had trauma and PTSD and I'll just say, you know, really quickly that we do notice that a lot of people who have had experiences, however you want to label them, whether it's, you know, abductions, close encounter experiences with all manner of different beings. I've noticed that there, there's a lot of trauma there too. And so what I really appreciate, and I'm sure he does too, is that, you know, listening to you for a couple of years now, and that I've also been professionally trained in how to interview people as well, that we really appreciate the way that you handle the subject and how you, you know, deal with your guests. And it's just very sensitive and respectful. And we've been asked to go on other podcasts and we've always said no. So you're the first (laughs) because we appreciate you so much. I didn't know that. Well, I'm extremely flattered, especially coming from you guys in the professional fields that you're in. Thank you so much for saying that. No, thank you. We we appreciate your work and basically normalizing a, a lot of this stuff, which, you know, for a lot of us, this is our life and it, it is kind of normal to us by now. And, and then it, it helps other people feel like they're not alone and which is really important. And which is why we don't have a problem talking about our history because we've had a lot of people ask us about it because of their own experiences. So we like to, you know, kind of pay it forward or, you know, however you consider it and and help people out because there've been other really great people we've come across in the past that were really open about it as well. So it's really appreciated. I think, I think you do really good work. So, so I, I think we'll start out with saying that I have known each other since we were four years old. We're in our fifties now. Our families grew up right across the street from each other. We originally came from Southern California and we basically grew up in cow country in an area called Dairy Valley back in the day. And so the area was very uh, out in the country, lots of cow fields. Our, Our little neighborhood was completely surrounded by big open cow fields. It was incredibly dark at night. It, was, it, it kind of made sense that a lot of people didn't see things that were going on at night. So, so that's kind of how we got to know each other and our families were very involved with each other. And so that was my, my white half of the family, which is my mother, my father, was the one that was from the Cree family and my traditional grandparents lived in the area as well. So I, I was raised in both. I'll just say going into this, that I I think the white side of my family was fairly typical in, in a lot of people that I've met that were raised maybe in a particular religion a particular set of beliefs. And when you would mention anything at all about anything you wanted to fit under the umbrella term of the paranormal, it was absolutely dismissed out of hand. Or it was explained away to be angels or demons or whatever fit into a particular set of beliefs of that family or that area. On the flip side of that, my Cree family, this was all very normal. Our elders spoke a lot about it. You know, we referred to Bigfoot as the forest people and they were to be respected and left alone. There was a relationship there that went way back and, and so that doesn't seem very woo to us in any way. And then also with when people refer to, you know, quote, aliens, for us, they were the star people or the star nation. And again, our relationship went 
way back as how our, our elders taught us. So growing up in these two kind of conflicting belief systems and culture, you know, for a kid is, it, it can be a little interesting <laughs> at times. But when I was, you know, around four or five, here's this family that moved in across the street from us. And so it was Al and his parents and we all became quick friends and we became best friends and we ran around everywhere together. And, you know, it was the kind of neighborhood where you, you, all the kids would run around barefoot through the fields between the horses and cows and chickens. And you'd come in when the street light our, our one single street light would go on, you know, at dusk. And so, but what, and we were the best of friends, but the thing that we weren't sharing with each other is what was happening at night separately. And we were such good friends and our families were so kind of intertwined for a while that we would sleep at each other's houses almost on a nightly basis. I would be over there, or he would be over here. And then we noticed things started happening. So I, I wanted to start with his because he actually had more that happened when we were kids than I did. And it was different, but I did, I did actually witness some of it. So I will let him start with his. Okay. So my encounters have mostly been with the beings that people call greys, you know, the typical little three or four foot guys with the big black eyes. And the very first time that I encountered one that I remember, I was four years old. I was in the backyard by myself playing in my sandbox, which was right up against the side of the house. And I was looking down at the sand and playing with my plastic dinosaurs. And <laughs> I saw someone come around the corner of the house, like eight feet in front of me. So I looked up and it was a gray. And as soon as he locked eyes with me, I couldn't move. I couldn't do anything that he didn't want me to, which was the, the typical experience I've had with them every time they show up. And I could see behind him, maybe a hundred feet away in the field on the other side of the fence was a craft, maybe 40 or 50 feet wide, not really saucer shaped. It was more like, a, it was more smooth than that. It was kind of lozenge shaped maybe like a red blood cell, but without the concavity, you know, just floating about 10 feet above the air. And there were two smaller grays standing next to it, just watching the proceedings. So this guy, he stood there and held my eyes for a while and I couldn't move and I got the feeling that, you know, I didn't speak, but I got the feeling from him that this was the beginning of some kind of a project that, you know, I don't really know how they communicate like that, but got that strong impression and also got from him some feelings of, felt like he knew me already. And actually some feelings of, of regret from him for the discomfort that he was going to be causing me in the future. And then I'm not sure how long I was held immobile like that. It's, it's so weird. I really have no idea how they do that. As soon as they make eye contact, you're just stuck. But he eventually let go of me and, you know, you would think that I'd be either terrified or amazed and try to follow him or whatever, being four years old. But for some reason, I just felt like it was imperative that I just look down and keep playing with my sand sand toys in the sandbox. And then he, he went back around the corner and I didn't really see him go back to that craft, but it left. And that was the kind of the end of that first story. And then, and then not long after that, a whole lot of other things started happening with a great deal of frequency, but yeah. So after that, after that, not too long after that, not every night, but almost very frequently, three grays would show up in my bedroom at night. And it caused me 
to have this wild, irrational fear of going into my room. I couldn't talk to my parents about what was going on, but I was really, really afraid to be in there with the light off. I mean, like abnormally afraid. It wasn't just uh, a kid's normal fear of the dark because I knew that there were things in there waiting to take me. And I get annoyed when people say it was, you know, they try to say sleep paralysis or bad dreams because I wasn't asleep. A lot of times they'd be waiting as soon as I went in there and they would take me or I would lay down in bed and sometimes they would they would, it's really weird. They would step in through the walls. Somehow they can make solid objects face through each other. They would just step in through the walls and then they'd be around my bed before I could do anything and I'd be immobilized and they would then take me. It's, it's really, I have no idea how they do this. I suspect it's technology, but they would levitate me out of the bed and then go with me and they would pass through the walls and they would pass me through the window at the head end of the bed and the window was closed and I, they phased me through the glass and float me out in the yard and then up to the craft that was hovering over the backyard. And uh, it's really, it's such a bizarre feeling because I could feel myself going through the glass. I could feel the cold glass and the condensation on the outside of it passing through the crown of my head all the way through my body out to the bottom of my feet on my way out. I have no explanation for this. And then I remember going with them just kind of up. I remember seeing the roof of the house as I went up, seeing the branches of the trees go by and being taken up into the craft. And then once there, I had the typical experience of being, you know, stripped of my clothes and put on my back on the table and examined and having various instruments stuck into me, which was scary and painful and the weirdest thing, I mean, the most absolute bizarre thing, at the end, that they, they would reassure me the whole time that, you know, they were going to bring me back. I wouldn't be harmed. They kept telling me this. And at the very, very end, when they were done, when they were wrapping it up and about to take me back, okay, this is going to sound so weird, and it makes me laugh, but they would ask me if I wanted ice cream, <laughs> specifically mint chocolate chip the green stuff from Baskin Robbins. And it's like, okay, that was my absolute favorite ice cream as a kid. The only thing I can guess is that since they're telepathic, they could reach into my mind and see whatever my favorite thing was and then try to use that to make me feel better. I don't know. What in the hell would have happened if I never said yes, right? I, I said no. Don't blame me. I said, oh, I just want to go home. It's like, and the attitude that I had was like, are you kidding? I just want to go home. No, I don't want ice cream. And uh, But what in the hell would have happened if I said yes? <laughs> Did they have some on board the craft? I mean, what? were they going to raid a closed Baskin Robbins at three in the morning with me? <laughs> oh, what? I don't know. I should have said yes at least once to see what would happen. But I, I didn't. And then they would... They would put me back and then this happened almost every night and I would wake up the next morning and convince myself that it had been a bad dream and convince myself that I was having the same bad dream every night in, you know, the same every night in every specific detail. And I was asked myself, how come, how can you have the same bad dream every night, the same in every detail? And that went on till, that went on till I was about 12. 12 years old, most nights, I was taken and uh, brought back. And uh, after that, the, the visits became less frequent and changed in nature somewhat. But for yeah, the better part of a decade, it took me almost every night. And there were, there were signs during the daytime. I mean, I was abnormally tired all the time during the day. You know, I did poorly in school. It was like I was always sleep deprived, even though my parents, you know, made me go to bed on time. It was because this stuff kept happening. So a couple of, later on, I, I'll say that and then I'll move on to the next story. I did have the opportunity, you know, most, most people who have been abducted don't get taken as often as I was. And I thought that was weird. So I did have the opportunity to ask them one time, you know, why did you guys pick me up so much when I was young? Because most people don't get taken almost every night. This is just weird. And they did, they did say that I had been modified 
and that they were closely tracking my development as I matured in order to see how those modifications played out. But when I asked, you know, well, what, what exactly are those modifications or is it an upgrade or what is it? And they will not, they won't tell me, they wouldn't tell me what those were. And that's, that's annoying because I mean, <laughs> I, I don't feel special, <laughs> right? Aside from being autistic, I don't feel special. I don't have any special abilities or anything. I feel just an, I'm just an ordinary human as far as I can tell. So I don't, you know what? I don't even know if they were telling me the truth when they answered that question or not. Who knows? Moving on to a little bit later, after the age of 12. So let me think here. Okay, so when I was nine years old, we moved from the little tiny fallen apart house where these abductions were taking place and we moved just around the block to a much nicer, bigger house because my dad had got a better job and was making more money. And they still kept taking me. And my bedroom there, there wasn't a window to take me out of. And anything around that property, there wasn't big trees around it and the street there had more lights. So at, when instead of taking me directly up to a larger craft, once we got there, and I'm, I'm guessing just so they could be less visible, what they would do is come park a small, a small craft, maybe 10 feet in diameter over the roof of the house, right over the top of my bedroom. And then they would take me through the ceiling instead of out the window. And I, I don't know why it makes any difference to them where they take me, which way they take me, but there weren't any windows to take me out of in that bedroom. So they would take me through into a really small craft that parked right above the ceiling with the roof or above my bedroom where I'm presuming because it wouldn't be seen from there and then that one would go somewhere else but then so a couple of notable events from being abducted you know later on as I got into my teen years I was taken and it, it less often maybe a couple of times a month but it wasn't for I was no longer being put on the table and had that really nasty thing done where they stick instruments into you and everything later. It was more like, more like um, a cursory examination and then it would be put back most of the time, nothing invasive. But then, but the, I specifically remember one time where I was on the table and it wasn't, it wasn't the typical exam room. I was on the table being examined and it was almost like, it was arranged almost like an old operating theater, you know, where there's a pit down and then there's like terraces above, except on those terraces, there weren't a bunch of people observing me, it, it, like lots and lots of control panels, like for a big vehicle, kind of like the, maybe the bridge of a ship or something, it almost looked like with lots of grays and other beings being very busy at the control panels. And there were a number of them around me on the table and I don't know what they were doing. It was nothing invasive and I, my clothes hadn't been taken off that time. Something went wrong. I'm not sure what, but there was just, I don't know, it felt like a horrendous impact and a very loud noise. It was like something hit the vehicle that I was in. I don't know how large that vehicle was, pretty big, judging from what I could see of it from the inside, but something hit the vehicle and I felt it lurch sideways. And then all of a sudden, everybody scrambled, including the, the team of the little guys that were around me on the table doing whatever they were doing. And they all scrambled for control panels and started furiously working. And I suddenly found that I wasn't immobilized anymore. So I sat up and the first thing, I, and by this, this point I had been taken so many times that I, I didn't panic anymore when I found myself there because so many hundreds of times I'd been taken and returned, you know, well, not exactly happy, but at least unharmed, it felt like. So I didn't panic. I sat up and I was, and I thought, cool, I can move, you know, nobody's, nobody's keeping control of me. And I looked around and I realized, well, so what, what am I going to do? <laughs> right? Run over to a control panel and push buttons on it and somebody else's craft to see what it does. No, <laughs> right? There's nothing for me to do. It doesn't matter that I can move. 
and but that didn't last very long all of a sudden just all my senses went away and everything was dark and i had a sensation of rushing backwards through darkness very very fast and there was a great sense of urgency about it and then i found myself I found myself in the supine position, phasing back through the roof and ceiling of my bedroom. And then as soon as the end, as soon as I was clear of the ceiling, uh, it was that really nasty popcorn ceiling that everything <laughs> had back, back then, you know, in the sixties and seventies, as soon as I was clear of it, as soon as my nose was clear of it, and I really distinctly remember that popcorn ceiling an inch from my face. <laughs> Whatever had me let go, and I, and I just just free fell the last three feet onto the top bunk of my bed, and landed on the top cover. So I don't know what you know, whatever went wrong, something obviously went wrong with that. I I guess I appreciate them returning me in emergency fashion and keeping me from harm. You know, I don't really approve of what they were doing, but I hope that whatever went wrong there, I hope they're okay. I never did find out anything about that. Didn't have the chance to ask anyone. And then another time, so I'm moving on to another significant event. I won't go into detail about it, but my, my family life wasn't good. There was a lot of abuse. So about 15 years old, I was getting pretty close to suiciding because of how bad the situation was making me feel. And so I had just, and I had just gone to bed and I was maybe a few days from deciding whether or not I was going to end myself. I was at a pretty low point. So I went to bed and uh, my bedroom was in the back of the house down a very long hallway. And my bed was a big bunk bed. It was, it was one of the L-shaped ones that, that was half dresser. And the, this is important because of the way this played out, that the bottom bunk was not, it's not one of those where the bunks are stacked. It's the one that's L-shaped and sits in the corner and the lower bunk sticks out from the top one at a 90 degree angle in the corner of the room, you know, do you mm -hmm. know the kind of I'm talking about? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that, that detail is actually important as we'll see in a moment. I wasn't asleep yet. I had just gone up there, laid down. The room wasn't dark because the rest of the lights in the house were open and the lights were shining in through the open doorway. And I had laid down facing outward towards the room with my back against the wall as people with PTSD will do. <laughs> and I just laid down there and I saw my great grandmother who, who was not dead at the time, right? Not a ghost. That's just solidly as I'm looking at Nuna right here next to me. I see my great grandmother walk in through the bedroom door. And I thought, well, you know, it's, it's only nine 30 at night. It's not that late. Did she come over to visit? You know, I was really confused because I had no idea that she had come over to visit and I looked at her and I said her name and so I didn't know you were here and she walked across the room over to me with, and she approached me and she put one, she stepped half stepped up onto the bottom bunk to reach me. And she had weight, her foot sank way down into that foam mattress. So I saw that she was really there. And then as soon as she locked, she, as soon as she, locked eyes with me. I couldn't move. And then she wasn't my great grandmother anymore. She was a mantid bean, a really big one that was hunched over to avoid hitting her head on the ceiling would have been about nine feet tall if she could stand up. And she locked eyes with me. And I guess I, I don't need to go into the details of what she told me, but she told me things that would keep me from suiciding. I mean, a number of which is, you know, don't need to go into great detail, but I said that was really important for me to stay alive because things needed to be done that weren't going to get done if I opted out prematurely among others. And then she released me as in broke eye contact, turned around, walked out of the room. And then I, I shook it off and I jumped out of bed. And uh, I was running down the hall and then she wasn't there. I don't know where she went when she stepped out of the room, but she wasn't in the hall. And I ran down the hall and I, I remember the, the memory of her trying really hard to change into something else 
as I was going down the hall and I was trying so hard to hold in my mind what I had actually seen. And I just could not. And by the time I got out to the end of the hall, it had been forced into my head that what I had seen was my great grandmother walk into the room, come up to me and then disappear. So then I was just, at that point, I was just, I knew something was very wrong and I was just confused. And I was asking my mom where great grandma had gone and why she was over. And then, you know, as I kept, I was so puzzled by this and then by, but I I was able to remember it again later, but right then when I was going to, you know, when I would have run out to say what I really saw, I was, I was somehow forced to think that it was something else. Later, I was able to remember who really came into my room. And, you know, there's, I've, I've endlessly speculated on this, like how, how, how did she, how did she on her way in before she made eye contact? How in the hell did she make herself look exactly like my great grandmother? Right. I mean, how, how crazy does this sound? Is that technology? Right. Is there some kind of, there's some kind of hologram cloaking device she has that gives her a disguise or since they're telepathic can they just make you see whatever they want you to, you know, if they've got control of you or I think the least believable hypothesis is that she would be something like an actual shapeshifter, but I've had to consider that possibility. And Right. I don't talk about this very much. Nuna and now you, there's very few people who know this story because who, who in the hell would think that I'm not just insane (laughs) saying that a nine foot tall man had walked into my bedroom disguised as my great grandmother and stopped me from committing suicide. I mean, you know, come on. (laughs) Nevertheless, yeah, that happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, you, you kind of started to say this very same thing, but it ended up turning into the, the mantis creature. Why come in as your great-grandmother to start with at all then? I think the, my, best, my best guess about that would be because they seem to have control of me as soon as they make eye contact. And my best guess would be to keep me from totally freaking out before she actually got close enough and had that eye contact uh, and had that control of me, right? It, because my, my bedroom was pretty big, so, you know, ducking in through the doorway, if, I had, if I'd been able to perceive her real form as soon as she came in, I totally would have freaked out before she could have got over to me because the, the bedroom was pretty big. So right. I, my best guess is that, however... However, that was accomplished. It was done in order to keep me from completely panicking and, you know, doing whatever I would have done if I completely panicked at the time. I mean, obviously, I wasn't a medical professional with 30 years of no panic training when I was 15, right? (laughs) And and, and 15 or or 45, if you see something like that coming in your room, it would be, I'm dreaming, head under the covers, eyes closed. So that makes sense to me, what you just said. I mean, I've seen so many things at this point that I wouldn't panic. In fact, I really, I really appreciate it if she would show up again without any funny business of altering my consciousness or immobilizing me or any of that shit so that I could just have a look. Because honestly, at this point, I think she was magnificent. She's a, this huge, magnificent, beautiful person. She's like, like an off-white cream color. And I'm... Um, I remember, I remember the details of those big compound eyes and especially her creamy white underside that had like big plates, cream colored plate interlocking plates going down the bottom side, kind of like, I don't know, not well, like a mantis, right? Have you ever seen a big mantis, Mm -hmm. like a a earth insect mantis and the, like the, the underside of the abdomen on a big female has the, you know, imagine that like nine feet tall. They're, they're actually really pretty. I don't know that a lot of people would agree with you, but. <laughs> I know they, probably, they probably wouldn't, but you know, I think those are pretty too. So, <laughs> but okay. So I'll use the word magnificent. You can't, whether, whether you're scared of it or not, you know, something with an exoskeleton that big, 
you've got to say that's really amazing. That's magnificent. I think a lot of people would be more inclined to think it's like the queen from aliens rather than something that's really yeah well no yeah that's, <laughs> that's really that's really scary if you if you've ever seen the movie ender's game the the, uh, the bugger queen um, at the end the color is spot on and the physical appearance is somewhat close hmm. so if you want if you want kind of a close approximation if you have seen the movie looks kind of like her if you haven't seen the movie skip to the end if you want to see something that sort of looks like one of the bigger kinds yeah and when she was speaking to you you say you label it a she because she it had a feminine voice no voice i've never heard any of them speak with a voice it's all they just get in your head and drop information there i don't know how they do that and you just knew it was a female yeah you can you can i can i call it their flavor you can just you just you can it's it's like recognizing a face but it's internal you can just you 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 recognize the person they have a flavor they have a personality that comes through which is definitely female extremely intelligent with an ironic sense of humor and hmm. not really any not really any malevolence that i can tell but on that though and i mean of course i'm i'm very glad that she showed up and she helped you out and she stopped you from doing what you were thinking of doing but Something that you mentioned earlier that they told you was that you were modified. And yeah. I'm, I'm assuming that by that, they meant that they had done modifications to you, correct? That they were, that they were then monitoring any, whatever the data, whatever that, that is for them, I don't know. Do you think that her stopping you then was on behalf of them, that it was a more selfish thing on their part. They needed you around because, well, we're not done getting the data that we need from you because of the modifications that were done. That's what I think. That's what Nuna thinks. I give a lot of credibility to that hypothesis, but having, I think they, I, I think some of them like me and I, and maybe actually care about what happens to me, but that's secondary to whatever their project is. You know, we've, we've actually, over the last few years have talked to a lot of other experiencers and we've noticed that other experiencers who are on the spectrum have been told the same thing, which I find to be really interesting. Yeah. That was my next angle was, were they already attracted to you because of the autism? I have no idea, but to, to, to answer your, your, your previous question, which I didn't answer. Yes. The idea that came through was it was a modification that they made. And in fact, modification slash upgrade. And let, let me, at this point, let me be really clear when they're communicating telepathically, no, I'm not hearing voices. You have to make that clear because people who haven't experienced it assume that you're hearing a voice in your head and it's not, it's not like that at all. It is instant information whatever facts plus associated intentions and emotion that the being wishes to convey just drops in all at the same time. Mm-hmm. And then, and then if you want to, if you want to think about it or talk about it later, you have to unpack it into English so you can communicate uh, about it to another human in a linear fashion. But when they're talking to you, telepathically it, everything everything they say factual information intention emotion whatever they wish to convey it just drops in at instantly it's just there i don't i don't know how they do that but they don't use you know they don't use linear time bound languages you know words in a linear sequence like like we do when we're speaking to mm-hmm. each other it's all instant so that i mean it's it's important to say that no it's not it's not voices in your head it's it's whatever they do and I have no idea how they do it, but yeah. So yeah. Modification slash upgrade is what they actually said. And yes, they did it, but they won't tell me what it was. So, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I'm autistic, high functioning, obviously I have no sense of smell. That's a little odd. My vision was like four times normal acuity. Used, used to be, I mean, when I, you know, now I'm wearing glasses because I'm getting older, like everybody does. But before that happened, I could, 
you know, I could see things a mile away that other people couldn't see at all. You know, I could read side freeway signs when I was driving, no matter how far away they were. When I did the eye test, I could cover one eye and stand three times as far away and read with one eye the smallest print on the bottom of the eye chart. So that, you know, that's kind of weird. I was rather stronger and faster than other kids my age. And I still am a bit, even though I'm slowing down because I'm 54. But I, I have, you know, I, I have no idea if, you know, some of these characteristics are, they're, they're not outside the range of normal. You know, I might be over to one side of the bell curve, but I, I don't fall outside the range of capabilities for an ordinary human, and I don't feel special. You know, this is all just speculation because I have, I have no idea if any of the things that make me a little different than most people are due to any modifications they did. And I don't even know if they were telling me the truth when they said that. So, you know, this is all just wild guessing on my part, trying to figure out stuff that I don't know, which is one reason that all the stuff I don't know is one reason that I like to listen to other people's stories, because sometimes I think maybe I'll get another piece of the puzzle that I don't have. And then it's the reason that we wanted to share, because, you know, I know there's other people out there with similar or different experiences that have no idea what the hell is going on with them either. And, if, you know, if we all compare notes, maybe we can maybe we can get a little bit more of a complete picture of what's going on with these beings and what they're doing and what they want from us since they're not really forthcoming with that when we ask. The the no sense of smell, was that since you were, I mean, a, a baby? Was it always like that? I've never had a sense of smell. Hmm. It's like being born blind. I have no idea what it's like to smell anything. My oh. nose is just a couple of air holes. That's all it is. <laughs> I mean, that can be a good thing sometimes, you know, but I don't. <laughs> right? Well, I mean, I don't know if I, um, one of the things that happened almost every night when I was taken is they would put instruments up my nose, way up in there. That's what I was wondering about. Because I, I, when you said it, I grabbed my nose and I'm going, I hope that he's not going to tell me that they shoved things up there. And sure enough, oh they God. did. They absolutely did. And I woke up and uh, there was, there was actually, I had sneezing fits a lot and there was blood all over the walls around my bed because I would sneeze blood onto the walls all oh. the time. Oh, and, you're little. And, oh, every night, yeah. Yeah, you're I was really little. little. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah. I had sneezing fits and headaches all the time, and I would and I would have sneezing fits after they after they brought me back. I would have sneezing fits at night, and so there was it was gross. There was dried blood all over the walls because I would sneeze on the walls around you know, and I'm pretty I'm pretty sure it was some of from what they were doing, but. I don't know. And then there was the last time I was the last time I was physically taken anywhere. Yeah. Well, I I wanted to add so while that was all going on with him, I was spending the night either at his house or he was over at mine and I noticed that there were a few nights where so we had it set up in his bedroom where he would be sleeping up on his little, you know, twin bed in the corner mm. ne next to the window. And I had a sleeping bag and a little bed set up on the floor next to the bed. And I remember that I was never really, I never really felt comfortable over in that house. I was really, really glad to be with him. I mean, we were just inseparable. We were like twins running around everywhere together. But for some reason, when the sun would go down, I, I just didn't like being in that house. And so I, I didn't really know why in the beginning. And I noticed that whenever we were together, maybe half the time, I would actually sleep better. And I always figured that well, it's because somebody's with me or in the same room, you know, maybe I feel safer or something. But one particular night I was having trouble sleeping and it, it just felt kind of creepy in the house, you know, I think we were probably seven years old and I was sleeping with my, you know, facing the wall 
and my back was to, you know, him, his bed and, and the window. And I heard what sounded like a couple of small people walking around on the carpet, which really confused me. But then I thought, oh, well, you know, he's like getting out of bed and the dog was in there. And so, you know, maybe it was him and the dog. So I, I went to roll over to look at him and I couldn't move. I felt my body felt kind of tingly, really strange. I couldn't roll over to look at him. And I started having a panicky feeling. I didn't know what that was, but it, it was like all of my skin on the back of my body that was facing that direction just was trying. It, it just felt like it was crawling and you know, your hair is standing up and almost like there's electricity in there or, or something like that. And, and then the, it was kind of gradually going away. It felt like it was going away, like farther away in some odd way. It's really hard to describe. And so I could finally move and I, I rolled over and looked behind me and I literally saw his from his knees down, his knees to his feet, him lying on his back and the tail end of him being floated out through the closed window, through the glass. And okay, that was weird. So, and it really scared me. I didn't know what was going on. It seemed like there was some kind of light source that was leaving with him. And then Oddly enough, I just got the idea in my head, oh, you just need to go back to sleep. And I rolled over and went to sleep, which is not normal, obviously. But I would come to have that feeling many more times in my life after that. On another night, more than one night, I would get kind of get that feeling again and look over and he wasn't in his bed. He wasn't in the room. I walked through the house, you know, the parents were asleep. The whole house was asleep. It was, you know, it was like two in the morning or something and couldn't find him. Next thing I'd know, I'd be waking up in the morning and he was there with blood all over his face coming out of his nose, blood on the wall, blood on his pillow, you know, on a various nights. It was maybe 50% of the time when I would sleep over and we would wake up in the morning, there would be one of those things there there'd be he'd have to clean up you know a mess and his mm. parents always thought well he was a kid that got bloody noses but it didn't look right and it didn't feel right but he wasn't telling me at the time what was going on and then there were other times when i would either i was over there or he was over at my house and i get up in the middle of the night to toddled down the hallway to go to the restroom and and he was in bed when I left and when I'd come back he wasn't there and then wake up in the morning and he he was in bed again so but I never told him at the time about what I saw he wasn't telling me about his experiences at the time and then while all this was going on at that time when I would be by myself sleeping in my own bed across the street from him, you know, on the nights when we didn't stay over. I was having my own experiences, but they were mostly different than his. So I, I honestly don't know how often this happened, but I remember at least two very distinct moments where I think I was the earliest one I remember, I was about three or four. And so it was actually my grandparents' house, my, my mom's parents. And I had my own little room back in the corner that faced out over the back cow lot. I remember being awakened by, like, my body was kind of tingly, maybe a slight slight low hum that you can more feel than hear. And 
then a person who my my Cree family would call a star person appeared next to my bed and and told me exactly how he described where it's it's in it's in your head it's information it's not a voice outside of your head and this person's mouth was not moving and they said that they were going to take me on a trip and i remember looking at him and it's kind of odd because it was my first memory of this and he looked familiar like i knew him and he felt like he was very familiar with me and we'd done this before <clears throat> And I remember being floated out through the closed window. And it's really, it, it's a really interesting feeling because it, I would say it feels like when you step, slip down into a pool of water and there's that water line that you feel going up your body, that's a different temperature. So it, it's like you feel this cold line that's literally passing through your entire body. That's a good description of it. Yeah, as you're, as you're going through the glass. And I remember looking up in the sky and it is darker than hell out there. I mean, there is, it is cow country. There's miles and miles of just cow fields surrounding surrounding this neighborhood on on about three sides i would say and this was in i would say this was this was in the early early 70s 1970s i'm 57 now i saw this massive craft that looked like it was so big that i couldn't see all of it it was it was above the house and kind of halfway over towards the fields. And if I had to estimate, I mean, it's really difficult because, you know, when you're a kid, it's really hard to tell how, how large things are. But I would say it, it must have been like a football field size. And what I could see from out, you, you know, being next to the house and the house blocking out part of it still coming out the window it looked like a huge black triangle if I would kind of guesstimate out from what I was seeing. And it had some really dim lights around the edge, but it was massive. And so we floated up to there. And I remember being that young, I wasn't scared. I remember giggling and kind of having a good time. <laughs> And, you know, it just seemed not very weird at the time, or, you know, I, I felt very secure with the person I was with. And to describe the person, you know, we call them star people, but I think other people call them Nordics from the description. So they looked human, very, very tall, some kind of light colored robe down to the ground, long hair really kind face, highly intelligent. I felt very comfortable with them. I've also seen them at some of our tribal ceremonies when I was a kid and then probably <clears throat> just a few years ago. I'm not sure. I can't really go into detail about the ceremonies. It's kind of a no-no, <laughs> but so, Anyway, I remember going on the, on the craft. It wasn't, it's not the first time this happened. I, I remember this happening at least twice. And walking down a hall that opened up into this huge room. And I think I, I think I sent you a sketch of this. It's in a huge round white, whitish room. And the entire far wall was a massive, it was either a window or the wall had technology in it that made it transparent when they wanted it to be. It was very smooth. This person kind of escorted me through the middle of this huge round room. And I remember walking by and seeing 
one of the small gray people, the gray aliens. I, I don't like to use the word alien, but so one of the small gray people was at a control panel with another star person or Nordic, and they were doing something at this panel and looking down into like a drop down section of the floor that was a couple steps down and they were intently watching something and this person walked me around that area and I remember looking in there at what was going on and it was several children that were my age which at the time probably would have been four or five years old and these kids were sitting cross-legged on the floor together and they were smiling and giggling and each one of them were levitating these blocks in the air that were different shapes and and like passing them to each other and playing some sort of game and the the people at the control panel next to them had some type of i'm not really sure there was some kind of interaction or something going on, or they were monitoring what the kids were doing. And I asked the person that was with me, what are they doing? And they said that you don't get to know that you're not part of that program, which was really confusing to me, but mm. okay. <laughs> and then, but I noticed this one kid in particular that was closest to me and we made eye contact when I walked by and this, this is cute little kid. He was a little blonde white kid with a little blue, white and red striped shirt and a little crew cut and shorts. And for some reason, I really noticed him and he seemed familiar to me, but I mean, there's no way, you know. So we moved on and we walked over to the window. So he stands at the window and we're looking out this window and what I see is the earth like we are a few miles or I'm trying to think of how to say what the distance is. It's way closer than being on the moon looking at the earth, but it's outside of the atmosphere. So it took up like half of the window I could see you know, the reflected light off of it. I could see the little thin line of atmosphere and then the black beyond that. And I think I sent you a sketch of that. And I remember putting my little hands up on the, on the glass or whatever it was. And, and it was really, really smooth. So he stood there and we looked at the earth and he started talking to me and pointing at it with a a real feeling of concern he was very concerned about something and there was a little gray person with him that was just standing by doing nothing but there for him so i don't i don't know what they were doing but and then but the interesting part is i couldn't hear what he was saying i in my memory everything's there but for some reason what he was actually saying to me at that point is blocked out. And that always really gnawed at me. And as a researcher, a professional researcher, you know, I can't, I can't let things lie. <laughs> I really, you know, I get curiosity gets the better of me and I really, really need to find things out sometimes. So when I became an adult, I kind of experimentally went and had a regression done, which took a lot for me to work up to because I really wanted to see, you know, it, okay, do these work and can I find out what was being said? Um, but that was much, much later. And that was a few decades later. And so while he's standing there talking to me, in my memory, I do hear him say something like, I'll be right back or I need to do something. I'll be right back. And he, walked away and left me alone with the gray looking out the window at the earth. And then he came back and he said, I need to take you back now. And we walked back by the kids and I 
looked at them again and looked at this cute little blonde kid again because he just really looked familiar to me for some reason. And, and then I have no memory of exiting the craft, going back down. The next thing I remember is being plopped down the last few inches from going through the window down into my bed. And I started crying because he was leaving and I didn't want him to leave. And he said he would be back. Now, what's really interesting, as if none of that's odd or interesting, but the thing that really, as an adult later, drove home to me that this wasn't in my imagination at all, is my grandmother whose house that was. My grandmother, she was a really amazing person she would rather die than lie about anything. I don't think she had the ability to make anything up. She was a very, she was a very ethical person. She was my hero. She was everybody's hero. She was just one of those people. You know, she was just gold. She was just a goddess. And decades later, when I was taking care of her, when she was dying, she told me, that when I was a baby and I was in that same room in my crib, she, she was home alone and everybody was at work or wherever. And my mom lived there too for a while and she was at work and everybody was gone and she was there alone with me taking care of, you know, baby me. And she said that she walked down the hall to check on me and she looked in the room and standing next to my crib was what she described as a Nordic. Except because she was religious, she thought they were angels. There were two of them. And she described to a T. I never, I never told her about any of this. I never, ever told her a thing. And she described it to me to a T, the star people that I saw. She said that our dog at the time, who was absolutely just would not let strangers anywhere near me and was very protective, was laying underneath the crib, awake and looking, but super calm, like nothing was going on. And my grandma said that they just gave her a really warm feeling, and she said hello, and and then she just kind of went, oh, all right, well, you know, the baby's still asleep and everything's great. So I'm just going to go back down the hall and do dishes like everything. <laughs> like, <laughs> what? <laughs> so when she told me that, that was an interesting, you know, validation. Although honestly, you know, when you have enough experiences in your lifetime, you don't necessarily need it anymore because you know, you know, I'm of sound mind. I know what I've seen. I know what I've experienced, but still it's really nice when something like that happens. And there was another time when she told me that she saw in, in our house and also in Al's house, she said that she saw what she thought was a demon in the corner of one of the rooms. So she furiously started praying and I asked her, well, what does it look like? And she described to a T a gray. And I thought, well, okay, that was another interesting point. Cause this lady, she does, she does not make things up. But I thought it was really interesting that, you know, I, I, I was there and I saw some of the things that Al had described. Now, did you want me to ask a few questions on, on your side of things before Al continues? Or should I just, you, yeah. Al, you want to go? Yeah, yeah. You know what? I, we are both, you know, you can ask us anything. There's nothing, <laughs> there's nothing off limits. So I do find it extremely interesting. And I can imagine that getting that corroboration from your grandmother was ex extremely uh, nice and validating and gave you a, a sense of relief with that whole thing. But 
I do find it fascinating that, and it's been said on many a podcast, it's not just mine, that, you know, your upbringing, that includes religions, beliefs, just maybe what you want to see. These things don't even really, and Al even brought up the word shapeshifters, but they don't even really need to do that sometimes because it just depends on who's looking at them because to you they were, I mean, I know you you said, well, the word alien, I don't really want to use that, but I mean, you know, to most people they go, oh, the Nordic aliens, you know, so they just call them the, the aliens, but she saw two angels. She didn't see Nordics. So I just found, I find that part so fascinating because at the end of the day, a lot of times these guys don't even need to shapeshift at all. <laughs> right. right. I mean, it's, it's real easy to just use someone's own point of reference. Yeah. We all interpret what we see through the filter of our own culture and, and right. beliefs, whatever, whatever we think we know. Right. Yeah, I, I find it really interesting, you know, when you talk about different different facets of if you want to use the word paranormal for everything. I know there's some purists and, you know, you separate out the different areas. But what's really interesting to me is, you know, if you get a room full of people together, they're not going to agree on all this stuff. You know, it's it's funny how that you'll you'll get some people that you know they do really heavily operate under their own their point of reference and even with this kind of thing it's funny how it's real easy to be kind of hypocritical and go well i know my weird stuff's true but i think their weird stuff is really out there and i don't you know right it, it, i think it's 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 really, it's kind of humorous to me in a way, but, but again, you know, I mean, with my, my Cree family, we, we believe that star people seeded humans here. You know, some, some tribes believe that there are ancestors and others believe, you know, not, not so much that, but so, I mean, it does kind of go into the whole belief system of, you know, well, if we, if we think we're the only people, then that's kind of egotistical and that's kind of crazy. Humans you know? are not I the mean, only game in town, you might it, say. Exactly. I mean, to me, we're kind of, we're kind of the, the undeveloped blind culture who are really, really behind, apparently. I, I think it's funny how people, there's a lot of people who don't want to believe there's anyone else out there, which, you know, I call them people. My, my culture calls them people. They're a nation. When you have a group of people together, it's a nation. So, you know, Bigfoot is a forest people or forest nation. Some of us call them the hair, the hairy man nation. Are there star people in, instead of alien? I think aliens is, I'll use the word alien just so that everybody's on the same page and everybody knows what we're all referring to, but it's not my favorite term. So. So in, in Cree belief though, if you have any contact with the, the star people with the Nordics, that's 100% a good thing. There's no, there's no malevolence to these experiences? No, you know, it's, it's more like we believe that there are many people that come here off this planet. Some things live here and some things don't. They visit. And not all of them, it's not all love and light. Some of them are, are really, really nasty. They could be in spirit form. They could be physical. They can have both. Not all the star people in general are good and, you know, benevolent. There are visitors who are absolutely use us as a resource in one way or another we have our own beliefs about what my Navajo friends call skinwalkers, but 
in some of our tradition, it's not necessarily that it's a, a human that went evil. It's more that it's a visitor from a race that they're just users and they, they only look out for themselves and we're a resource. So, so no, I, I would say that all of my experiences have been with, with the Nordic type star people have been positive. But because I'm also human and I also have grown out outside of that culture, I don't necessarily trust that none of it's deceptive as well. So I personally, I know Al and I have talked about it a lot amongst ourselves that, you know, personally, we don't like to hear anyone out there that says, well, they're all love and light or they're all positive and or that they're all negative my personal attitude is we don't know and we need to be okay saying we don't know because even even growing up in a, in a you know halfway in a cree culture where these things are normal i do have a lot of questions i don't have all the information i i know the beliefs that I grew up with, but I've also met a hell of a lot of really scared shitless, to be honest, people who've experienced a lot of things that have PTSD because of it. I, I do have this odd kind of a foot in two cultures and two worlds type of thing in my experience, but I do have a lot of questions and a lot of times, you know, just as an aside that I don't want to speak too much out of turn about, you know, when, when we go to our elders for advice and teaching and questions and things like that, some of them don't necessarily just hand you everything and it's up to you to do your own work and find out answers for yourself and you know you're not handed everything so in in a lot of ways it teaches us to flex and grow and you know which is which is part of our belief system and helping each other do that too which is one reason why we don't have a problem talking about our experiences Living in Washington, it's really interesting having my take on, my cultural take on Bigfoot, because there's a lot of people here that are really into Bigfoot hunting and, you know, we know people like that, but in my culture, you leave them alone, you know? I mean, it's one thing if you want to go hiking a lot and hope for an encounter, but my question to people is always, well, what are you going to do when you find them? Because the respectful thing to do would to be, you can't tell people where that place is because that's probably going to be a death sentence for that, that forest, forest family, you know, I, I do find it fascinating like you, that there are different people with different takes and different experiences. Well, Nuna, you mentioned PTSD and I wanted to say something and this is kind of a general sweeping term but something about the these guys the in quotes you know you could take any any number of the the beings the aliens whatever term people use they lie a lot and it really yeah. really ticks me off because al said something earlier you know that they told him don't worry, you know, you're not going to be harmed. Well, bullshit, because physically yeah. and mentally, he has been harmed. A lot of people have been through that, right? Like you said, it can't just be all light and love or all negative, and it's not. And I'm sure Al would say the same thing, but look what Al's been through. Yeah. Yeah. Al, do you have any... Besides no smell, which I would hazard to say, maybe they did that to you, maybe accidentally, who knows? Do you have any, you know, strange marks on your body, anything like that? Well, strange marks. On, I've, I'm covered with scars because I'm too adventurous and fearless. But <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, if I did, if I did, I, I might not be able to tell if it was from them. But the... 
I have a, there's a questionable thing on a CAT scan of my head, right? Right up in the area where they used to stick that instrument up my nose. But I mean, it looks like a cyst. So I, you, it's in the bright area where that instrument went. But again, it's not proof of anything. It could just be an ordinary cyst, you know? Or maybe that's where oh. they stuck the upgrade, whatever the upgrade is they're talking about. Whatever. I mean, I did, I did, I have had the experience where there's like a probe with a little BB shaped object goes way up my right nose. I feel a really painful crunch of bone up behind my right eye. And then the, the device comes out and the BB shaped thing isn't on there on it anymore. Right. And that's approximately in the area where there's a little defect on the CAT scan, which I've I didn't have the CAT scan looking for, you know, looking for evidence of this stuff. It was for something else, but, but, you know, it, it doesn't, it doesn't prove, you know, correlation doesn't prove causation. I can't, I don't know. Right. If it's the same thing as like the, the things that about me are unusual. Those could happen without any of these experiences, right? Nothing is, you know, nothing, nothing, nothing about me that might be considered special is, is, outside the boundaries of possible natural human variability. So it's just, it's hard, it's hard to tell. There's things that you could, you could, I could try to claim their proof, but I, I don't want to do that because I, I'm really careful not to try to make claims that I, that I can't know for sure. I mean, there's a, there's enough things that really happen that I can't prove. Right. Right. So. That's just a lot of nope. I, there's so much nope in there, and it really does yeah. tick me off when I and I've, we've heard that right so many times. I know you guys have too. Oh, you're fine. We're not going to harm you. Well, okay, uh, that's that's a lie. You, you well, definitely yeah. did. I'm. I guess I'm. I'm grateful that they didn't just vivisect me and leave the remains in the dumpster. <laughs> I mean, dumpsters. yeah, that's that All is right. good. No one's wearing a. It's not an Ed Gein skin suit situation, but still, <laughs> still, it's yeah. not. I mean. Uh, and, and I, I still want to, we still need to get to your last experience. And Nuna, I want to know when, if, you know, if you recall what would be your last conscious experience, of course, too. But one thing before I forget, and Al brought this up earlier, because I was asking about the whole, you know, the, the grand, the great grandmother comes in. Why did she look like that first? And then it's actually a mantis being. But when you were at his house and you had your back turned and then you, right, you eventually roll over to see him going through the window, I, at first I was like, well, well, why, what did they screw up? Why wouldn't they, you know, quote unquote, turn you off to make sure you didn't see that? But then again, if you're going off what Al says, they were probably like, well, she's turned away. So no harm, no foul. We don't need to, she, she's sleeping. So we'll just leave her, leave her lie. Is that what's going on there? Or was that maybe a screw up on their part? Because at that point, unbeknownst to you, I guess really, super very consciously you had already had experiences in fact i believe during one of as an adult after we got married i can't remember i i honestly don't remember how this came about one one of my last encounters i actually asked the star person you know why why are our experiences so different i didn't ask it like that but i think my general thing was how come we're not taken together and he said it's because we're not in the same program and that th no other questions were going to be answered so like you you know i yes we're returned we're quote unquote unharmed multiple times they always return you blah 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 however i'm insanely annoyed at the withholding of information i mean you could at least grant a person the room to volunteer you know what i mean i i'm i'm a big person of it, it makes me think of back in my graduate program days when we we're doing like a psychological experiment and learning about the legalities of human subjects and, you know, getting 
you know, writing up disclosure statements and, and permissions and, you know, parameters of your, you know, whatever it may be that you're doing. And a lot of times it was just doing questionnaires and, and things like that on really sensitive subjects or sensitive topics with people. And it makes me think of that where, you know what, they could at least have the decency to tell you what program you're in, why they're doing what they're doing so that you can make an, an informed decision or at least not be scared shitless when some of this happens. Because I will tell you that we have talked to people before that were right on the edge of suicide because of their experiences. There was a person in particular who will, and I want to protect their, their privacy, but we've talked to so many people who, you know, after a while, you really do need to get out and talk to other people about things. It's only, you know, it, it only worked for so long when it's just the two of us privately talking about our experiences together. And we discovered, we ventured out and discovered, well, there's, you know, groups of experiencers who get together and share their experiences and support each other and talk about it all the time. So we decided a few years ago to try that. And the first time we were there and Al told about some of his experience, uh, there was this man who was sitting across the table from us who just, he went white and he had to get up and excuse himself. And eventually we found out that to a T down to the tiniest detail, his experience matched Al's. And it's the first time he'd ever heard someone else talk about this. And so he asked to meet with us. And I think we were talking until two in the morning or something in a coffee shop. Later, we found out that if we wouldn't have met him, he, he was going to shoot himself. He was actually, what he did for a living was Homeland Security. And he couldn't tell anybody, not even his wife. I believe his daughter saw him taken to one night, his little nine-year-old daughter. She saw something and... So people really struggle with this, especially, see, that's what we think is so good about your podcast, because then people, there's a lot of people who are terrified to, you know, either because they're trying to wrap their own brain around it still, it's pulled out the rug of reality out from underneath them, they're having ontological shock, they can't share it with their family, they have kids, maybe they're afraid for their job. I'm sure you, you run into that all the time. And what's really great is for those people who don't have anybody they can talk to, you know, a podcast like this is the next best thing because then they can sit here and listen to other people talking about their experiences that actually matches their theirs. And then they feel like they're not alone. And But there's a lot of people that don't have exposure and they're left to deal with this. And so you're right that it, it is very traumatic and it's not all positive. Maybe hopefully with the, the Grush thing going on, I don't know, maybe something will come out of that or not. Mm -hmm. I don't have a lot of hope for that, but so, so I would like to fast forward to a thing in particular that was the most mind blowing for me personally other than having my grandmother yeah. validate some things. And so this would have been, gosh, almost 10 years ago now, or like eight years ago. So we had about eight years ago, we, you know, decided to kind of participate in an experience or group. And we were brand new to it. And they said, hey, there's this, there's this international UFO conference in Phoenix every year and it's a lot of fun. You should go. And I didn't know anything about it. Neither did he. And so we went, yeah, you know, it's kind of time for a vacation. So we go to it. It's interesting. We meet all these people through the group too. Like we got to have dinner with Stanton Friedman and, you know, shot the breeze with 
San Freeman. What's his name? Yeah. Which, oh, Travis Walton. Yeah, Travis. Yeah. So it was interesting. A lot of interesting people. A lot of people had some of the same stories that we did. We were asked to go on podcasts and we said no to everything. Then we're, it, it, there's a break and, and, you know, there's like hundreds of people there, if I recall. Mm -hmm. And everybody's milling around. And I see this guy in the crowd and my mind instantly recognized my brother like oh my brother's here you know how you can be in a crowd and there's somebody you're extremely familiar with and you you may not even know they're there and your brain just immediately goes oh there's my whoever it is unmistakable make a beeline for that person so i see my brother there i <laughs> I said to Al, I said, oh, there's my brother. And then I, and then I remembered, I don't have a brother. I don't have any siblings. And I'm standing there really confused. And I see this guy and he's staring at me too. He's looking at me like he recognizes me. And we're looking at each other across this crowded room. It's this really strange moment. It, it was so strong. It, it wasn't one of those things where you see somebody who looks similar to somebody you know, and then you go, oh, no, that's not him. I'd never seen this guy before ever, and he didn't look like anybody else I knew. And what's really odd is we look like siblings. It's very strange. So then I noticed people that were in our group go, oh, that's, and then they said his name hey, why don't you come meet him? Because he's actually in our group, which was kind of weird. So we go meet him and we're both saying, I feel like I've, you've been to a meeting before, right? And no, we've never met. We've never seen each other before. And it, and it just gnaws at me. It just gnaws and gnaws. And it just, there's just something, I don't know what's going on. And I didn't say anything, but he said the same thing to me. So, so over the course of the next few months, we, we really click with him. We hit it off. We become friends, you know, we hang out outside the group. And I said, I I'm texting him one day and I said, would you happen to have a picture of when you were like five years old? And I, and I didn't tell him why, I don't think. And he said, yeah, I'll dig one up. So he texts me this photo, you know, the, the typical little, you know, little school, nice school photos, you know. He sends me one of himself and he was that damn kid on the craft that was levitating the blocks with the striped shirt. And I don't expect anyone to believe me, but I know what I saw. That to me was the most interesting point of, you know, moment of any of the memories I have. I showed Al and his jaw dropped because I told him about my experiences on the craft before that. And so, so I asked, I, without really saying much, I talked to our friend and I said, what other kind of memories do you have besides being taken by Grays? And, you know, because he had the same experiences that Al did. He said that he has a memory of being on a big brown ship that was white on the inside, being with other little kids and levitating blocks in the air. And so that's when I knew that, okay, I'm not just making some non-existent connection in my own head here. Cause you know how people just kind of automatically do that a lot. All these years later, we're still really good friends. We all consider each other family. And he said, he's even told his wife that, you know, he feels like I'm his sister, like we're somehow related. I can't bring myself to get a DNA test, <laughs> but I just, I don't feel like I need to, but it, it's, uh, that was just very interesting. And so 
he and his wife have had very similar experiences. We've got this connection and we've actually had people tell us that the four of us should write a book about it, which we thought might be interesting, but so he's also yeah. married to, I mean, it's the exact same situation, essentially. And one of the questions that I had for you guys is, what do you think the chances are of two abductees and all of this happened or began happening right around the same time for both of you prior to you even meeting? And then you move across the street from each other, you become very close, and then eventually marry. What are the chances of that? Is that some kind of a predestined thing? So what I forgot to start out with is that, you know, I'm like five-ish at my grandma's house and she says, hey, why don't you come with me across the street? A new family just moved in and they have a son that's your age. I went, oh, cool. Because I was a really, really shy kid, really, really painfully shy and I didn't have friends really. And so I thought, oh, that sounds great. You know, so we come over there and we go in the house and they're like, here, they introduce us. Cause you know, the adults have already met and said, Hey, this is Al, this is Nuna. And when we both looked at each other, we both said, oh, there you are. And then Al says, come with me. I want to the backyard. I want to show you where I live now. And it felt like I, I already knew him somehow. Right. I mean, yeah, I remember, I remember felt, that too. Yeah. I felt like I already knew her from before and it felt like we found each other as we were supposed to this time around to me. So because this was, you know, back in the day and we're in the, our fifties now. And, you know, when we were in high school and graduated high school and went off to college or whatever, you know, there weren't cell phones yet. God, I sound so freaking old, but so there was no cell phones. We somehow lost touch and one of the families moved away. So everybody lost contact, lost phone numbers. And, you know, life happened. We married other people. You know, when we were about eight years old, we told each other we wanted to marry each other. My grandma was really into that, too. She, she's like, yeah, I encourage you. You guys are great kids. And so, you know, we married other people, the wrong people. Life happened. Divorce happened. And then one day my grandmother died and I was taking care of her. So I was, you know, going through her phone book and notifying everybody. And I found Al's mother's phone number buried in her. I mean, my grandmother died when she was 90. So she didn't talk to anyone for a long time. She had dementia and she lost touch too. So, so I couldn't believe it. And I called his mom and I said, Hey, I wanted to let you know, you know, grandma died and her funerals, blah, blah, blah. And do you know where Al is? She didn't have a phone number to give, give me. And I was really bummed because I think she'd moved away and she was getting older too. And a lot of life happened. And for some reason I didn't get a phone number from her. And then all of a sudden out of the blue, Al called me. And then we've been inseparable since we immediately, like not long after got married. But the interesting thing though, is when we, we were kids, we didn't, that was the only thing we didn't share with each other is what was going on at night with us, with all of this interesting stuff going on. And part of it was because our parents actually went to a kind of bordered on a cultish church where you don't talk about that stuff. I mean, you could get, you'd get a beat down for talking about that stuff. And, and in fact, when I was about 10 years old, my mother took me to her church and they did an exorcism on me, their version, because they didn't like that I had been exposed to my Cree family and, and the traditions and they said that, you know, well, 
we have to basically pray pray the pagan away oh, you know that all, yeah all that stuff so so you didn't talk about this stuff and i know there's a lot of people that can say the same like when they grew up you don't talk about this and i could with my cree family and it was normal but you don't dare mention it to you know everybody else and so we didn't tell each other about it we were so in trouble you know fearful of getting in trouble and then once we got back together and found each other again as adults we started telling each other everything that was that wasn't that was an interesting moment and then we also had and then it almost started all over again because it was kind of quiet in between there wasn't a whole lot going on and then it was like as soon as we got married there were some experiences we had together but it wasn't as much as when we were kids because it seems like you age out if there's some kind of program going on or some systematic thing they're doing with humans it seems like at some point you age out and it's when you're in your 50s or 50 or it seems like i'm hearing that from a lot of other people and so so that was really interesting it it does seem kind of odd that you know we we do feel like we've known each other literally forever to kind of an answer your question but i mean there there also were things that you know as an example when we went on our honeymoon we rented a cabin and we saw a gray in our cabin. I mean, it's our honeymoon for God's sake. I mean, can't you guys just like go on vacation or something? Like we find it funny now, but at the time it really wasn't. So, but he did, he did have a really interesting story from when he was younger that actually he got validation from his parents because they were they were all together in the car and had an experience. Yeah. 